is now where Kirk from What's New Video Games sits down with me and we talk about something. And this time it's Borderlands 4, Take 2, buying Gearbox as Embracer Group is just kind of cleaning house. And we had celebration of the Gearbox purchase and then mere hours later there were layoffs, which is, I was kind of surprised by the celebration. I was like, do y'all not know what's coming? But many people were saying, well, it's mm. better than them shutting down. So, Kirk, glad to have you here, man. Welcome back. We got a we got a a more uh, nuanced conversation today. A little more. We're, we're gonna get in the weeds, kind of like when we were talking about uh, exclusives. You know, like it's gonna get maybe a little bit spicy because we're talking about corporations and yeah. their agen- their agendas and the stuff people really like like us to get it get into it on. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna end the stream that we were just doing. And I'm going to bring you guys over. We were talking Stellar Blade. I'm going to redirect you guys over. So as you come over, do me a favor, man. Smash that like button. Take a second. Especially, we love you lurkers, but don't lurk too hard. Don't lurk too hard. Make sure you smash the like button. It helps the video find more people. So let's just kind of talk about Borderlands first. Because I think people that are going to click on this are going to be like, okay, what is going on with Borderlands? So there's an official press release from take two and it's lengthy but within it they did say they uh that we have loved partnering with gearbox on every iteration of the borderlands franchise and are excited to be in active development on the next installment in the series and randy pitchford the founder and ceo of gearbox said joining forces with take two interactive and 2k will help gearbox ascend to our next level take two and 2k have demonstrated repeatedly their commitment to our engine of generating creativity happiness and profit we set the bar for interactive entertainment and achieved remarkable results with groundbreaking breaking record selling games when we worked together at arm's length as partners i'm incredibly excited about what we can accomplish so, and he says, you know, now that they're fully aligned as one. Well, Borderlands 3 did not, didn't do it for me. It didn't do it for a lot of Borderlands fans. A lot of people pointed to Tiny Tina's game, Tiny Tina's Wonderlands, and thought it was a, a better game. Do you, do you worry, Kirk, or when you think about Borderlands 4, do you worry that, like, now we're going to be under sort of this larger, you know, another just another large conglomerate are we going to deal with some of the microtransactions that we know take two likes to put into their games you know are we going to get into a live service borderlands instead of just sort of like the traditional borderlands that people would like where are you at on the impact of this on the franchise and the next iteration of borderlands um guys let me know if my mic is bad because i'm getting some weird feedback so so i need to fix that um with as far as 2k absorbing gearbox and and borderlands i'm not super worried because it was 2k that published them in the first place is my mic is my mic messing up you sound like you you (laughs) you sound like you breathed in helium or something like your your voice is a different pitch it's really no all right it's really bizarre it just started happening like like halfway into you asking that question oh no (laughs) What? I sh- I was going to try not to say anything, but it's, it's, it, it's, it's just do the whole wrong. episode. <laughs> something's wrong. I got to fix it. Hold on. <laughs> like, it's like all of a sudden we're in Munchkin land in the Wizard of Oz. You know, April Fool's. Yeah, apparently this is an elaborate April Fool's prank from Kirk. Well, while he's trying to sort that out, I'll give you guys what I think. I'll give you guys what I think. I personally think that for Borderlands 4, they do need to really iterate on the basics quite a bit more. You know, whether or not that's borrowing from some of the things that were praised in Tiny Tina's uh, Wonderlands, or just really borrowing from other games that have gotten the looter shooter aspect right. They've they've achieved better, I think, you know, loot tables, better end game, uh, better character design, class design, things like that. So I would be a little bit worried about them just sort of doing another Borderlands like they did with Borderlands 3. Borderlands 3 didn't feel like they iterated on enough of the basics. Like even the co-op level scaling for the loot, you guys have heard me kind of rant about that. That didn't actually function properly. Uh, You end up over leveled if you do any of the side missions. And then the stuff that they're dropping is, uh, it's not helping you. It's always under level this is always a balancing issue with games i'm you know i'm running into this a little bit right now in rise of the ronin right like i'm clearing the map 
And because I'm clearing the map, whenever I go to do the main quest line, I'm a little over leveled and the gear I'm getting is not sort of, you know, at my level. So it's still happening. No, now it sounds right. Okay. Let me know if it does it again. That has to be one of the best glitches ever, though. Like, the fact that it, it, like, you didn't get choppy or robotic. It was just all of a sudden, it was like, oh, you sound like you sucked in some helium. So, <laughs> as I just kind of vamped there about, you know, some of my concerns about Gearbox in, in Borderlands, just kind of doing another Borderlands. Borderlands 3 just didn't iterate enough. And now that they're going to be kind of coming under an organization that does like their microtransactions, you know, they, they do like their live service games. I would be in support of a Borderlands game being live service and being ongoing, but I do think there's risk and there's concern there after what we saw happen with Kill the Justice League. So where are you sitting <clears throat> with your just general viewpoint of take twos coming in and the probably the next big thing out of Gearbox is going to be Borderlands 4? Again, I'm not super worried about it because they did publish Borderlands 3, and I thought Borderlands 3 was like... Uh, it, it, honestly, it was pretty refreshing in terms of like not being live service. Like, it was it was very much like the tried and true formula of like, this is just a looter shooter. Sure, it's co-op, but like, it's intended to be a consolidated, like, isolated experience. There's not like an online meta game. You know, you're not like trying to grind like for every season to do raids or anything like that like it's just mm-hmm. you go in you play the game you have the experience that you have and that really resonated with me like especially at a time that i personally was experiencing like a lot of destiny fatigue or i guess i should say destiny 2 fatigue it was very nice to like have that type of experience and so i really enjoyed borderlands 3 i enjoyed it the most out of the three of them um i, I haven't played so- one to be fair. Okay, so you you played borderlands 2 did you play the borderlands yeah. uh the pre-sequel did you play that one Yes, but not enough to like really like. I think I played like five hours. You're not missing that much in the pre sequel. The the one claptrap <laughs> DLC was really cool because they were like doing this weapon remakes thing, but you're not missing much. I, I'm surprised coming from Borderlands two to three that you liked three more. What what in particular did you like more? I I agree with what people are saying or chat like that the gameplay that is the best gameplay in the series. Like it feels great. Absolutely. That's, I just that's thought they much failed it. with the end game. Oh, I mean, I didn't. I sort of played the story and then played all the DLCs, and like that's like what? Like, what do you mean by end game? I guess. Well, they give you those things to run in the end, where you would go in and sort of farm for materials, and you could increase the difficulty. And that 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 was like a balanced nightmare. They were, they destroyed entire builds, you know, with one patch, and then the next the next patch would hurt builds again. Like there was just a lot of irritation. It really felt like they built the end game for streamers, and then the streamers kind of abandoned the game anyway. I yeah, that's that was not. I mean, I didn't do content creation at that time. I wasn't reviewing the game. I just was somebody that bought it and played it. Played it with my ex girlfriend actually, who was a really big Borderlands fan. So I had the co op experience there as well. I had a good time with it. Um, I mean, basically, again, I, I pretty much played through all the story content, and then there was the the i remember there was like a moxie that's her name right there was like a moxie Mm -hmm. uh base dlc and then there was like the i forget i forget the character's names the guy that like greets you at the beginning of borderlands 2 he he had a dlc and so like i I remember playing like uh all all through all those dlcs there were like four of them right they came with the season pass Mm -hmm. and then by then i played like 50 60 hours of the game if not more so i was like okay like i i got my got my fill, I got my money's worth, so I never really got to, like, that kind of end game you're talking about where I was, like, grinding the game, like, after playing all of the content. Like, like I figured, like, I was done with the content, you know? Um, and it's not, like, a Suicide Squad or a, or an Anthem or something like that, so I don't know if that's just because I wasn't, you know, making content or, or doing content creation or anything, but I don't think that would have changed my approach. So I think the biggest, the biggest concern I would have going forward is, like, are they going to get on this, like, Ubisoft and WB type of, uh, you know, agenda type train of like, we got to push, push live service really hard. You know, like what, like Mm -hmm. what Mm -hmm. WB was saying about Hogwarts, you know, the great, the great thing about Borderlands three was that like in the wake of everything's got to be destiny. Now they were like, no, we're going to be Borderlands. And so like, I, that was really refreshing. And then tiny Tina kept that going. So I'm not Nothing about 2K acquiring them makes me concerned because 2K published the franchise previously. 
you know? So it's not like, oh, warning, warning, you know, sound the alarms, 2K's involved now. They were involved before. But, you know, now that we're entering a territory of everybody's trying to make everything live service, like corporations feel like that really is the way forward for the future. And also maybe 2K has a little more control now with the acquisition. Um, I wouldn't completely dismiss any concerns that you might have in that regard. But like, I would say like, I have like, it's mild. Like we're, we're, we're at like yellow threat level or maybe even less than that. Like it's not, nothing serious. Right. Yeah. I'm kind of torn because I actually think what you just described with your experience with Borderlands 3 was probably part of the problem is that they, they didn't want to be a live service game. So their attempt at, at end game was probably a bit of a half measure and it just didn't mm-hmm. work all that well. And so I like live service games. I think that they are going to become more common. And I know, I'm, I'm pretty confident Take Two is going to want to turn Borderlands 4 into an ongoing live service game with seasons and battle passes. That wouldn't shock me in the least. But I wonder if that will be what Borderlands needs to f- to become more of a well-rounded experience instead of like this sort of truncated you can play and beat the campaign and then you can keep playing and beating the campaign and getting better gear and stronger gear or you can kind of roll over into these end game encounters and at launch you know people in chat are like they didn't even have targeted loot drops like you couldn't farm particular loot which is a huge no-no with the borderlands community especially after borderlands 2 so but then i'm torn because i'm like i don't want borderlands 4 to just be like live service gamified and turned into this chintzy thing but it could be what it needs to bridge the gap between like, it's not a live service game, but their attempts at end game just didn't hit properly. And then they're patching stuff and breaking people's builds. Um, So this, this could be just what the doctor ordered, or it could be a, you know, it could go exactly the route that everybody's worried with live service games these days. I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, we're kind of burying the lead here though, which is that, you know, it's embracer that, is are the ones that sold them to mm-hmm. take two and embracers kind of been the scourge of the industry for the last couple of years uh according to like games radar and vgc they've they've uh closed seven studios and canceled 29 or more projects including adels montreal's next you know deus x game like that would have been a landmark title like people really wanted that after uh was it mankind divided was that the most re- yeah it was after human resolution re- mm-hmm. revolution um, people really wanted that game, and uh, yeah, they just haven't been good for supporting studios like at all. They also closed Volition, which was the uh, the Saints Row developer, I guess, just because that recent Saints Row game didn't do well. But I mean, you know, they could have gone back to their old formula. They could have made Saints Row Five. Um, you know, so uh, studios don't really get a chance or a lot of a lot of wiggle room under Embracer, and also the games that have come out in the last several years or so like they haven't really been good i mean payday 3 is under that umbrella their player base is down to like peaking 24 hour peaks of like 300 players like it's insane i mean that Mm. game just came out like late last year and um the whole uh battlefront classic collection debacle Mm -hmm. with uh i mean they, they they literally used like actual mods from like community modders in the playstation version like Mm -hmm. there's a lot of controversy going on there and obviously like that game just doesn't run as well as the playstation 2 version from like 2005 like it doesn't make any sense um you know if you're going to do a remaster and charge people 35 dollars for it why it would perform that poorly uh you called that by the way you saw that from a mile away maybe not the catastrophe that it was but you're like this uh i'm not i don't know about this guys so I, <laughs> I got, give you I your, got your, a your... lot of hate <laughs> for simply saying blamed for that <laughs> it's simply blamed. All, all i said was it looked not good and it's got a 20% on Steam, so I accept apologies in the form of gifted memberships, all of you clip snipers. You know, want to give me grief. It's a pile of crap, and I, I could tell from the dadgum trailers. <laughs> um, but, like, uh, Saber Interactive just got out from under Embracer, and that's good. Um, but, yeah, I mean, they, they, they canceled that Deus Ex game, which is, I think that's, like, been the most public cancellation there's obviously those 29 games that we don't even we don't even know what they are, um, so it doesn't really seem like they're like willing to support and invest in these these studios. Uh, Dead Island 2 did come out of, you know, that whole corporate umbrella, so that's like that's a good one, you know, mm-hmm. that's kind of going against the grain. Uh, but yeah, like I, I you know, uh, they 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 bought 
Crystal Dynamics and then promptly cut all support for Avengers. You could argue Square was going to do that anyway. That's why they sold them. But, um, it, you know, the, you haven't seen a lot of fostering and supporting and things like that. And conversely, I think I said this to you um, maybe in a writer's room. Conversely, with 2K, like, yes, they are known for pay-to-win bullcrap in, like, their basketball franchise. I have definitely been somebody that has experienced that firsthand. Like, I like sports games. And 2K Basketball is like, you basically got to buy the $100 edition or like, why are you even playing it? Because it's like, it's like a barrier to entry. Like you basically got to drop the extra money on the career mode to not be, you know, donkey, whatever, <laughs> to terrible. Um, you know, it, 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 you can't even go online, basically. Like it's ridiculous. So it's just kind of people just know. If they buy 2K, you buy the 100 hundred dollar hundred twenty dollar edition because why are you even buying it day one then if you're not if you're not putting in the extra money that's bad that's really scummy and bad and it sucks that people continue to buy that game i don't but also conversely like there was a little studio and i need, I need to get them right um there's a little studio that made a game called the golf club and the golf club 2 um and th there's just a little, a little golf game in the wake of uh, in the wake of HB Studios, it looks like, yeah. A little golf game in the wake of, like, the Tiger Wood games not existing anymore. Obviously, EA put their first golf game out in, like, a decade last year. But the Tiger Woods games hadn't been out in forever, and there were no golf games. And um, HB Studios was like, we'll take a crack at it. And they did a decent enough job. It's a little clumsy, like, very double-A for a sports game. You know, like, uh, and, and for sports games, you really feel that drop-off in quality. Like, it's not like mm -hmm. a hack and slash action adventure game like where it's like oh it's kind of kind of doing the thing you know it's like the, these animations don't look so good or you know he's swinging the club and it doesn't look so you know or whatever like you really feel the the drop off there but they had a good core game that they were able to make with like very little resources and 2k went in bought them said you're gonna make our golf game gave them a ton of money got them tiger woods got them john cena got them all these different people you know steph curry michael jordan uh, all, like, you know, 10, 20 professional golfers said, we're giving you all the licensing. Here's PGA. Here's everything. Make our golf game. Give them a bunch of money. Yes, we're going to put microtransactions in on the back end, which is like, ugh. But, like, that studio now gets to go make a game that's comparable to the Tiger Woods games that, like, people remember from their childhood because they got that backing from 2K. And 2K was like, yeah, we should have a golf franchise. Let's These guys are doing it. Like, these guys are doing it well. Let's go buy them. Let's go give them money. It's so, like, I really like that. Like, I like that they are, as part of their ethos, like, they're willing to actually go, they're going to go out and buy a studio and not shut them down, actually give them money and, like, support them to go create, like, what their vision is and even buy into that to some respect. So, like, that gives me hope, I guess. Like, am I too optimistic, Lono? Like, I, I don't know. But I, I, I right. like that better than the alternative. Right, like, the hope would be, the hope would be that Borderlands 4 benefits from everything that you just said, because I remember I woke up that morning and everyone said, well, this is a happy ending, or they were essentially throwing confetti in the air, and I saw mm -hmm. people tweeting like, oh, he, you know, here's our new home, and then hours later they had to tweet and say that they had been laid off, and I'm like, that's got to be pretty devastating to feel like you're hanging over fire and breathe that sigh of relief like, oh, everything's going to be okay, and then be like, no, maybe not. I mean, I, I distinctly know what that's but like. But didn't Embracer account for, like, 30 to 40% of, like, all of the layoffs that happened, like, over the last year? I mean, they were just absolutely ruthless in terms yeah. of eliminating redundancy. Right, so right. So those people probably thought they were going to get let go anyway, you know? I mean, I, I... For sure, and I don't know the exact number that Embracer's contributed, and I certainly was like, why is everybody surprised by the layoffs like you had yeah. to know this was coming like take two was not going to make this purchase and then just sort of leave things the way that they are it was interesting they did it literally like the same day so you know and i don't disagree that a far worse situation would have been embracer would have been like we're just going to shut you down like we're going to just yeah. going to close the studio that would have obviously <clears throat> been way worse i don't think that was a likely outcome somebody was going to swoop in and buy this studio like gearbox has been in the industry for too long. You have too much institutional knowledge and experience, and then you've got an IP that is very brand recognizable with a movie on the way. Yeah. So I don't actually think that was a very realistic potential risk. And then everything you're talking about with what you know what they've been able to do, I'm thinking if they if they do this this layoff, 
that they went through, but then they start to reinvest in the studio or reinvest in support studios and let them really take a crack at a live service Borderlands 4. I actually think that would probably be better than just giving us another Borderlands game. Like, and I know there are going to be people that disagree with me on this. They're like, just oh, you're going to get clipped. Yeah, you're going to get clipped. Just do another Borderlands. Just make it really good. And I'm like, listen, that's all well and good. But I can't help but think that the birth of Borderlands was literally Diablo with guns. That was the premise. That was the napkin pitch that they came up with for this game. And looking at what Diablo was able to pull off with Diablo 3, like let's obviously not look too much at Diablo 4 because it's it's trying to fix itself. But Diablo 3 spent eight years crafting i think a really really great end game loop with seasons and with riffs and people really liked it and i'm thinking if you could contextualize that into the borderlands universe where you're going into you know use random you know randomly generated or procedurally generated environments and with the way their gun system and their loot system works i feel like there's so much untapped potential there to always kind of shake up the gun meta you're not going to have like the best gun or the best weapon now obviously skills and builds are going to come into that where they might need to like nerf and buff stuff but like could you see them taking it that road like could borderlands 4 kind of try to mimic and learn from what diablo's and i mean for goodness sakes no man's sky does expeditions and they're largely influenced by what diablo figured out with their seasonal format in diablo 3 i think a great model for borderlands which this would actually be like kind of weirdly cyclical um, would be Outriders. Because Outriders, you know, borrowed so much from Borderlands, right? But they were like, well, we're going to straddle that line. Like, they, they were like, well, we're, we're... Just to be clear, like, very upfront, like, this is not an ongoing game. Like, you kind of get in, you play it, and whatever, but we're going to make it feel as much like playing an ongoing multiplayer game for the time right. that you play it as much as it possibly can. And we're definitely not doing d- any DLC. Oh, wait, the game was wildly successful? Okay, we'll do one DLC. You know, so, like, they definitely straddled that line... To their benefit i think and so i'd love to see borderlands 4 do something like that like i it's like the it's like the uh tropic thunder meme like never go full live service like right. you know like i don't i don't want them to like you know to jump off into the deep end and try to make another you know suicide squad because we see what can happen there and you know you can say like oh you know it's it's gearbox you know surely they could do it but there's a lot of studios that haven't been able to do it. Even Naughty Dog was like, you know what? Can't be me, fam. Like, we're not gonna, we're not even gonna try. Right. Like, it's fine. You know, like so. Maybe let's, you know, let's let's set up, let's set expectations. Let's be strategic about this. Like, let's make a game that still gets at the core. Because you don't want to alienate the core fan base as well. There's millions of people that love and adore Borderlands for the experiences that they had with it when they were younger in the previous entries and so like i don't think you want to alienate those people by like putting a bunch of fortnite garbage in there 2k's got to be careful about that because they do that stuff they do that ea you know kind of microtransaction riddle bullcrap they got to be careful that they don't alienate people um i think they they have to straddle that line and if it feels like it's a fun time like co-op wise but the core gameplay and the core systems are still built around like the idea that like you can come in you can have a good time with this game and you can walk away satisfied and like you don't have to be a part of some like larger meta experience Mm -hmm. but it's there for you if you want it i think that that will be very much to the game's benefit if it feels like a destiny where it's like if you don't have the best gear and you don't have like if it if it if it's trying to have that pull of like you gotta get on every day and you gotta be invested in like doing these you know certain missions or whatever and having the best gear and stuff so you can do these activities if it leans too much into that, like, we've seen so many games where people bounce off that. Like, Avengers, right? Like, it had the hives. Like, it had in-game activities that you needed the best gear for. Nobody gave a crap because they didn't want to do it, you know? And so it's like, I don't know if Borderlands is the right franchise to make that jump when it's already so well-established as, like, not being that. Like, being the sort of looter shooter alternative for people who don't want to be involved in this, like, on online high investment recurringly type of game um i for one would be disappointed because i that's what really resonates with me about the franchise so i think it's okay for them to push it 
if you want to broaden it a little bit, like Diablo 4 is like a fairly good comparison, despite its pitfalls, like it sold gangbusters, like it sold hotcakes when it launched. And it's the most successful Diablo game ever, I think, in, in terms of like launch sales. And it pushed the horizons a little bit for the Diablo franchise of like becoming more of like that MMO light type of game, like with the world bosses and with the the, the collaboration and the co-op and stuff like they, they're moving more towards being MMO adjacent in the same way that like a Destiny type of game is. It's not just a first person looter shooter, like it's got those MMO light elements. It would be cool to see Borderlands do like that. But I no, I don't want them to go full live service. I think it would be better if they straddled that line. Well, and we know, I know historically that Randy Pitchford doesn't want Gearbox to be known as like the Borderlands studio, which it's too late for that, Randy. Like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? There's too, it's too late for that. And I know also don't carry your porn around on a flash drive around your neck. Don't do that. All right. Well, they also are apparently are working on a ho- another home world. Uh, another home world, and then apparently another I- like a new IP, and so I think that comes into like what what she brought up with Naughty Dog. Like, is Gearbox going to want to become a live service studio because that might be necessary for a game like Borderlands? So the big loot tables, the skill trees, the characters, the classes, all the different permutations and the enemies, and if you want to maintain that ongoing and you want to maintain a new content rhythm and battle passes or whatever it is, however they decide to do it, I wonder if they're going to consider the same thing that Naughty Dog considered and say, listen, we, we want to have a home world. We want to have this new IP. And you got Randy Pitchford still in charge saying, we do not want to be known as j- just for Borderlands. We want to be known for other games. Well, to your point, you know, about Take Two, you know, like it, it, with, with Embracer, they might have just gotten told, yeah, you're not making this game because it's not going to make us enough money. Take Two, like, like I said, they'll go in and they'll support but they want to get they want to get their check, you know. So it's like that is a concern. Like I don't mean to dismiss that. Like Take Two could tell them, like, hey, we've got certain benchmarks in terms of live service that you need to hit with this next iteration. Like mm-hmm. we're gonna need to see some implementation there as far as what this looks like. And they may not really have a choice. Like it may come with that funding and that support that they've got to sort of expand their model to be more ongoing. So like that is a concern. Like I don't want to throw take two under the bus because like at the same time take two supported games like red dead redemption 2 like it's just a masterpiece of a single player game so like i i don't think it would be fair to them to say oh well they bought gearbox now you know borderlands 4 is going to be a a microtransaction you know live service riddled mess i mean we, we don't have any indications of that right like that would be so speculative and almost doing a disservice to them but like I think it's okay to be concerned, like mildly. I mean, it's like like you said, it's a small victory, right? Like the game is going to happen. Gearbox is not going to get shut down. 2K is going to give them some support. That's good. Let's celebrate that. Do you think going they should going forward it's like there are some concerns still. Do you think they should move away from having such firmly curated classes and maybe let you do a little bit more classic RPG class building? Like would that be too much of a step out of the borderlands identity because sometimes i wonder if that's what maybe would help them as you say straddle that line give players a little bit more of that build volition and freedom and then not necessarily feel like we've got to come in and break this entire build i think you've got to have the characters you've Mm -hmm. got to have you've got to have the characters if they want to do like, because it's like it's like the Apex thing, right? And and Borderlands basically pioneered that, so it's not it's, Apex doesn't have any ownership of it. But it's like Overwatch as well. Like people have a sense of attachment to a character like Lilith, mm-hmm. or you know someone like that, where it's like this is my character, or like I know this character in the franchise. Like it's not just meathead McGee shooter guy eleven or whatever. You know, like it, it, they have that level of personality and and dynamic character to them in each game like people love specific games or all of the games because there's different characters that you can play as in all of them you know um and so like i think they've got to maintain that but it would be cool if like i don't know like it'd be cool if like there were like more variations it's like i remember like well they could do what diablo does they could just add classes and then you pick a male or a female and then the class 
has the skill tree, the abilities, and that's very identity. No, based. no, no. See, that's the thing. They've got to have the characters, like the name characters that have their whole shtick. It's so, like I remember in Borderlands Three. I haven't played it in like three, four years at, mm -hmm. the, at minimum. So there was like the mech girl. Like there was like the Titanfall mech girl. Mose. That was like her thing. She, Mose. She would get into a mech. Like that was like her thing, and she had the three skill trees. But like that was like her thing. And so I wonder if like to like what you're talking about, maybe they could do like instead of having just like three different like I think one was like grenade based and then one was like, you know, uh rockets and then one was precision damage. Like it's the same thing Suicide Squad's doing where you're basically like specking into a particular build with the with the skill tree. Mm -hmm. It's like a style of play. And so to your credit, like what if they did something like almost like Destiny where like there's Moe's, right? But it's like so that would that would be like her character but then like they're like so you have hunters titans and warlocks but then for each one of those you've got vastly different abilities with yeah uh, uh, uh i forget what they are void and electric and whatever so like what if they did like she she one is she has a mech and then another one is like she has like a i don't know like a like an exo suit or whatever that makes her like twice as fast and she's got like like I know Kung Fu, like Matrix abilities or something, because the exo suit is like, like it's like a smaller thing. It's like just like on her, you know. She's not in like a giant mech, but like something that goes with her character or something. So like you could expand it that way of like I'm the Mose that does this thing, like, but it's still like tied to this identity. Or there was the Beastmaster character, like he could also have one where he. I I can't think of examples on the fly, but you could take something like that where like he has this sort of cooperation with animals or creatures or whatever take that to another extent create a different variant of that but that's still integral to that character i think that they could give players like more option and expression that way like kind of make classes within the specific characters but i think it's important that they stick to that like core base of like four four to eight characters that like have the specific identity because like that's what people like really go to that franchise for i think yeah, I don't disagree. It's just interesting to think of the other ways they could do it. I do think you're correct in that part of Borderlands as an as a game and as an identity is you're like, oh, I'm going to play as Salvador. I'm going to play yeah. as Roland. Well, Roland, that was in the first game. And I think that that is part of what makes the game so great. But that's where they could really shine and contextualize. Okay, so a game like Diablo adds a class and then they have their seasonal play where like you start the character and you level up really fast and the drops are crazy and the bosses are nuts and you're you know you're getting to try out this new class or whatever well introduce a new character you could say you know they did this with characters DLC characters like Krieg where all of a sudden there's a brand new playable character who is Krieg you know who's completely different and you know and then that frees them up i also think from that need to say well, we need to completely break these builds or nerf or or weaken these people because a season could have modifiers, a season could have contextual power where your weapons need this or that or you got to augment. I think that's, that's where seasonal content can really give you a lot of flexibility and freedom to not feel like you have to take this contained thing that you've built and get it perfectly finely tuned and balanced. I think that's just such a fool's errand anyway. When you have that many abilities and weapons, there's always going to be something that rises to the surface. And that's okay when you're in a seasonal format where you're in a model where things are kind of shaking up, you know, every three months. Cause I, you know, Eugene said it in chat. He's like, Borderlands would kill as a proper live service. It's dumb to do sequels when you have a game in a world that could easily be added to over building brand new games in the same world. And I tend to agree. Like, what if over the course of 10 years, instead of building a sequel, over the course of 10 years, they just added four or five more characters. So you essentially get the amount of characters you would get in a sequel, but they don't have to go nose down and build a whole new game you know, after after you know four or five years of building the, the, the next game. Then they got to do it all over again. I mean, I'm biased. I don't want it. I, I don't want franchises that have traditionally been non-live service to become that when they're, it, we're already inundated, Lono, with these games. I mean, uh, I think it's okay, again, to expand sort of what your, what your property is. I mean, I didn't necessarily want a multiplayer Outlast game, 
but I'm, I've, I've been doing a review in progress for Outlast Trials for the last month because I've been playing other stuff like Rise of Ronin that like I want to give my attention to. <laughs> but like it's it's good. Like it's not like I was worried it was gonna be like a Wolfenstein Youngblood situation where it's just ham fisted multiplayer into this franchise that doesn't necessarily need it. But like no, they did a good job. Like they were like we're gonna do this right. We're gonna be we're gonna stay faithful to. The core elements of like what our property is but we're gonna make it to where you can play with friends and it's gonna be fun and it's like borderlands is already there so i think like the expansion of that concept does go into more like live elements and like at least like some sort of mmo light type of like stakes um you know like uh uh skull and bones is actually not a bad example where it's like it doesn't go full mmo or doesn't go full um you know, live service in the sense of like a Suicide Squad game or an Anthem game, but like you're you're grinding to get better loot or better gear for your ship, but it, it's also sort of a, con a condensed experience where it's really just kind of like you're going out and you're doing stuff and you can bring friends along with you and get into ship battles and stuff. So I think I I just I don't know I'm very biased. Like I I love games like Hogwarts, man. Like I love and and Rise of the Ronin. Like that's why. It's, it's got me hook, line, and sinker is like, it's just me in the game, you know? And I'm having a, a very curtailed experience. And I'm having those moments that you talked about, like with the guy that shows up and wants his blowfish back. Oh, that freaking guy. Yeah. And like, Borderlands has that stuff too. Like the writing, like people didn't like the writing of the third game. I did. Um, but like the writing is always very like campy and, and, and poignant to a degree. Um, it's, it's very out of pocket, very over the top. And... I just, I just don't want them to lose that. Like, I don't want them to lose the charm and the, the uh, mm -hmm. exceptional factors that made like Borderlands as good as it as it has always been. In exchange for, I mean, we just see these games like they feel so hollow, right? I mean, look at, I hate to keep bringing up Suicide Squad, but look at Rocksteady, like this studio that is just known for single player masterpieces and them flexing their prowess in that regard goes and makes this game that people just feel like is just hollow and soulless mm -hmm. primarily because that's the type of product that they're aiming for is like something like what you're talking about that people can engage with on an ongoing basis and i just i'm not willing to make the assumption that just because gearbox has made good looter shooters in the past that were offline <laughs> that they would somehow be able to do this online game that so many studios have failed to accomplish in a successful way better you know, and so well, like, I'm scared. I'm scared yeah. that, that it would ruin the, the, the property, basically. I think my pushback would be that, historically speaking, I think games like this, when they try the the more classic DLC approach, so that's that's what I feel like this would this would be. You'd be pivot, pivoting or, or sort of pitting just more of a classic DLC approach versus a live service approach, because they've traditionally always done a handful of DLCs, maybe one extra character comes along with one of them. And I think they usually do two, yeah. yeah. They usually do six total characters per game, I think. Right, right. And for yep. Borderlands 2, I think they they did two, right? Because they did Krieg, but then they also did... Um, I forget her, her name. She had the robot, and she was sort of meant to be like the... That's right, that's right. The couch co-op. If, if, you know, if you have a couch co-op partner that's not very good at these games, have them play as her. Um, so i could see that being one where you're always sort of getting that dlc where it's contained maybe it's a little bit thin i know in borderlands 2 they outsource a lot of the dlc they had other companies building them just so they could even hit the cadence like the pirate dlc wasn't even built by borderlands um mm. i'm sorry it wasn't even built by gearbox gearbox and so when i look at that format and i look at the live service format i think there are merits there's good and there's bad on both sides i do think that if they go the live service route they could focus a whole lot more on adding to the loot pool creating really really fun encounters and gameplay loops and not feeling like well we have to create a story we have to create this sort of linear thing in a new brand new huge space like all that development time could then be funneled to creating really good encounters like raids like that kind of content where there's a there's now a purpose to you getting stronger or getting good gear or chasing the new stuff or trying out the new class Lolo, you're basically saying that they should make destiny and there's been a lot of games that have tried to make destiny and they're not 
very good. Have there like, been games that have tried to do Destiny and have done adequate content, though? Like, Anthem didn't even have content for their live service Right, model. but there's a reason for that. Nobody sets out to make a crap live service game, right? I mean, like, all of these games thought that they were going to be successful, and they're good studios. I mean, BioWare was a box office studio. Like, it's only because they made that game that anybody you know, hesitates to put any type of respect on their name. They were flawless before that. I mean, seriously. Um, unless and Andromeda might have been before that, but uh, before Andromeda, they were flawless. And, like, but Bethesda as well, like, obviously not flawless with the bugs and stuff, like the meme of that, but, like, they put out these masterpieces in the form of, like, Fallout 3 and, and, and Oblivion and Skyrim, and then they try to do Fallout 76, and it's just, like, awful. And Avengers is the same thing with Crystal Dynamics. I mean, Division kind of got there, but, like, I think you and I would both agree that, like, they didn't hit the, the, the high that Destiny did. Like, they were the, the best contender or the best challenger that I think uh, this sort of age of live service games has produced. But most of these games, and especially with Suicide Squad most recently, most of these games have just been total and utter, utter flops. So I, I'm just very reluctant to endorse in that in any capacity for Borderlands. And you could say that with Destiny, what's the main draw, right? It's that it's that moment-to-moment, pow, pow, it's that gunplay, right? Like, it's, mm -hmm. it's amazing. Nothing feels quite like it, except maybe, you know, classic Halo and Borderlands. So, like... There could be something there, but I just, I don't know, man. I don't know if I want to see them roll that dice. I mean, again, I think I'm, I think it's minimal, not minimal, but uh, modest or moderate expansion. Like, yes, I think ongoing would be good, but maybe ongoing single player with co-op. Like, just take the Borderlands formula, which is that I maybe want to play with two of my friends or whatever, but it's like, it's still campaign or like, you know, player interacting with the game that's been created, not really this big online world and like stakes and everything like an MMO. It's more like, here's the experience, you're going to interact with it and you're maybe going to take some buddies with you. So if they wanted to mess with that some, like maybe more like, like Helldivers maybe, like instead of like Destiny, like it's like, there's basically like a, a you know for for a franchise that's played around with D&D tropes before this could be great. There's basically like a dungeon master you know pulling the strings uh, a little bit in terms of like well this month you're actually going to go and loot this vault for handsome jack or whatever like that could be cool like if they did that like I don't want them to build the entire game around that though of like you got to get this gear to go do this raid like I don't know that anybody's really done that exceptionally well other than Bungie in like well, a decade. And so it's like, yeah, you know, I think that they could make like ongoing stakes, but I, I want it to still be the same relationship and type of interaction that the player has with the game and with the, the world that the developers have created. I don't want them to lose that in, and exchange it or trade it out for like an MMO light experience. Even recently, though, we're learning that, like, Destiny has almost failed and flopped numerous times. I think we're putting our finger on the fact that, like, live service is just really, really difficult. Mm -hmm. And I think the gaming world is going through that evolution. And the evolution is there's going to be a bunch of failure before you get it right. And I agree with what Omar is saying. We cannot ignore the fact that Destiny actually borrowed a lot from Borderlands. So you, yeah. you, you, we've got to remember that if if that that comes full circle and Borderlands starts borrowing from Destiny, this is what I always thought would be perfect for Borderlands in an <sighs> ongoing model that would be more... I've talked about this a lot lately, that games that can focus on an ongoing model that is content-driven instead of player-funnel-driven. Borderlands would not need to be player-funnel-driven. I don't need a bunch of people that I can matchmake with. I don't need a bustling town like an MMO. It just needs to be content-driven. And something they could do is let's go back to the end of Borderlands 2 when they push that key in and that key shows there is a ton of vaults. That's your season. Your season is we found a new vault. We finally have a way to get there. We've worked out transportation or space travel or whatever the heck. And you go to the vault and the vault is essentially a rift like from Diablo where you run it over and over and over again it's got a set number of you know mechanics modifiers enemies that are new and fresh and then you got a whole new theme for your enemies 
your weapons. You've got contextual power because maybe these enemies are susceptible to this new stuff that you're trying to farm. You can then augment your old weapons from the, whatever this new technology is. I think that's just such an easy dunker for Borderlands to say we can have an ongoing content model that is content focused, not player funnel focused, and build it within the lore of the game. We never went Absolutely. and found all those vaults like at the end of Borderlands yeah. 2. It's like, let's go get no, them. It's, it's K-I-S-S. It's keep it simple, stupid. Like we've talked about this in Writer's Room that Helldivers is literally just queue up with your buddies or with randos, drop on a planet, shoot some bugs or, or, or get into it with the automatons if you want like a stressful time. Um, and accomplish your mission and get the heck out of there. Rinse, repeat. But it's the stakes, right? It's the, we gotta, we gotta save super earth. You know, we gotta do, or this is the major order. or This is what we gotta do right now. That that's, what's compelling people. But like the, the, the gameplay loop is like really simple, right? Like it's, it's very much just drop in, do the gameplay, have fun, get out. And so like. That's what I want to see for like what you're talking about. Like if, if they want to do narrative and stakes and world build, great. I wish there was more of that in these ongoing games. That's fantastic. That's the thing that Helldivers has nailed. Like they got the lightning in a bottle before anybody else, I feel like, in that regard. People really crave good narrative and good story and things to get invested in. Whether it's God of War or Last of Us, or it is one of these online games. I think that's what Helldivers figured out is like, we can do this for online. We can get people in and be like, this is what's going on. Don't you want to be a part of you know spreading democracy? Like, <laughs> they got people, right? Mm -hmm. And so, like, Borderlands is primed as a franchise to take advantage of that. To be like, all right, Vault Hunter. Like, they could definitely do that if they if they approach it right. I just don't want it to be a thing of, like, that the game is built around... It's got to be daily engagement or weekly oh, engagement, yeah. and you've got to no. grind the best. But that's what these games are, Lono. When you say live service, you got to expect that people are going to think that's what you're talking about because that's how all of these live service games are built. They're built around um, compelling that engagement from you constantly and making you feel like if you if you don't play the game for two months, you're just drastically behind when you come back because it has like these MMO type of elements and this loot grind and stuff. So like, if you're not talking about any of that stuff, I think that that's more comparable to like a, a an Outriders or something like that. Like, Well, but people are throwing the baby out with the bathwater. They're not realizing that Diablo 3 did that for eight years with seasons where you could just stop and come back anytime you wanted. No Man's Sky is, is mirroring that with their expeditions. Borderlands yeah. would be the perfect game to say, let's contextualize that. Let's use the vaults. You don't have to log in every day. You don't have to grind a battle pass. Like, you're grinding for loot. And you could put purpose behind it. Because we know that a vault would be protected by a big boss. And so you're not just grinding for loot. You're not just grinding for new stuff and fighting new enemies. There's a big boss fight at the end that would have the loot explosion. That's a reason for you to get stronger. And that's a reason for when you finish Vault 2, you know there's a Vault 3 coming that's also going to be maybe a little bit harder, stronger, whatever. And so there's this ever moving forward. And then if you take a break, no worries. When you come back, they could utilize that speed, like make a seasonal character, jump right in, level up faster, whatever, however they want to do it. You always want to have returning or new player onboarding built into your model so that nobody feels that what you were just talking about. Like, well, if I take a break, I can't play. I, I'm done. And then when people do take breaks, well, now they're not going to come back because you don't onboard them properly when they do. Or even make the compulsion for grinding loot. Like Borderlands has always been a franchise more than any other one as far as looter shooters go that has just had fun, wacky, enjoyable interesting guns right that do interesting and 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 fun things and so like if they didn't lean into the mmo light destiny style of like okay you've got to have the best loot to take on the raid boss and it was just like you know probably any gun you know that's in the in the upper echelon that's legendary or whatever will get the job done but on a like week to week basis we're releasing new wacky guns that we're doing trailers for on youtube or whatever that you know all of a sudden it's shooting like bobbleheads out of it or you know whatever it is right like like l like little munchkins or something or jumping out and like grabbing on the enemy or something like whatever it is or it's got acid or something or, or it makes the enemy run around and and it's tickling him or something like something dumb and goofy and fun so it's like yeah i want to use that on you know ventarion or whatever the boss's name is like absolutely do i want to shoot 
uh, like, you know, uh, little mice that talk in a high-pitched voice, like, I'm gonna tickle you, or, like, what, I'm making up this whole scenario that doesn't exist. But, like, whatever goofy thing it is that, like, only Borderlands would do, or only Borderlands could get away with in, like, an, a shooter game, make that the centerpiece of, like, why do you want to get this this new loot or this new gun or this gear or whatever, because it lets you do some crazy thing. Uh, you know, it lets you jump super high these boots or whatever you know or this gun lets you do whatever it is and like that's what borderlands has always been about i feel like so if that's the compulsion rather than just oh the boss is really hard unless you get the best guns that would be cool to see because i think borderlands has always been it's always been approachable right like it's always a game that you can play with somebody that is maybe a little less like game acclimated like a little less game literate in terms of like having like twitchy response time and think like you can play that and co-op with somebody that isn't like super experienced at shooters i think they would be remiss to like lose some of that uh, approachability they should like hold on to that and keep that like fun atmosphere going and if that's if that's the compulsion to get these fun weapons and it's not like oh i've got to get the best loot to beat the you know hardest boss i think that would remain true to the borderlands identity that people love so much yeah, yeah, lots of guns, you know, lots of humor, and if they continue to iterate on the gunplay and make it feel even better than it did in 3, I thought Borderlands 3 felt great. If they can do that, I, I actually think they they would do, this would work explosive just Explosive chickens. Yeah, explosive chickens, and people are like, well, take two's involved, there's definitely going to be a battle pass. I'll be honest with you, if every single season was a, was a vault, and the vault had a theme with the weapons and the enemies and the final boss, and there was also a battle pass... I'm okay with that. You can do a battle pass if your game is good. There's battle passes in Helldivers, and no one cares because the game is good. Battle passes are only decried when they're designed terribly. Like, I watched Angry Joe's rant about Kill the Justice League, and I was like, good lord, I dodged a bullet. I didn't even try it. It's designed so terribly. And Helldivers has got one that is grindy, and it takes a while. And guess what? Nobody's complaining because... They, there's no FOMO. They don't expire. It's always there. It gives you something to aspire to, something to grind, something to chase, you know, something to complete. And it works because people like the game. So I do know that you've got to go right in two minutes to Ginger. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, guys, he's doing a segment with Ginger Day. What are you guys talking about? Uh, the year of bad video games. Wait. This year? Yeah. So the- it's, a little, it's a little bit hyperbolic. Like I mean, the year of bad video games. So you you <laughs> okay? I'm gonna have to watch that one. I'm gonna have to watch that one back because this is a year of great video games. You know? I think so too. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, it's it's a little satirical, right? Because like Rise of the Ronin is just awful, you know. PS3 game. Oh yeah, the nuance of that discussion would be that there are so many good games coming that when you when you land in a mediocre lane, you're gonna be viewed as trash. Right, like if you're not absolutely stellar, like it's going to be a tough year. I do. I think yeah. it's going to be a tough year for games that land in the seven to eight because they're going to be viewed as trash. It's a tough year for pirate games, not called Sea of Thieves, apparently. Sorry, oh, yeah. boat games, boat games, not called Sea of Thieves. Yeah, yeah, you're a boat in that game. You're a boat. Well, here's what we're going to do, chat. Every day we end the day with the writers room. And it's an opportunity for me to plan the next day with you guys. And we are going to start doing segments in the writer's room as well. Like maybe reacting to a video, reacting to an article, just to give you another reason to become a member. Pick that $6 tier. You don't just get to help me plan the next day's shows. You might get my reaction to something that I don't feel like discussing in the public. Some of the drama and some of the bad takes we've seen from certain outlets. Maybe you'll get a little bit more candor for me. If you can't come to the writer's room, where are you guys doing this next segment? Over on Ginger Prime's channel? Uh, work to game and probably Ginger Prime also. Okay. Um, but definitely work to game on Twitch um, and work to game on YouTube. Okay. Well, I'm going to let him go so he can do that. I'm going to start the writer's room segment and then redirect you guys. There'll be a link in chat. If you can't come to the writer's room segment, then head over to Ginger Prime or work to game to watch that segment that they're doing and check out later check out my uh eddie gordo release today check out my tekken 8 review on pure dead gaming that's a written review so i'm like i'm like a professional reviewer now i get to be on open critic and stuff to so check that out like whenever you're um bored and want to read something on your phone or something so yeah tekken fans if you like to read which 
Maybe you do. I don't know do how that. much overlap there is there. I think people like written reviews because they can skim them quickly and get a good summation. Yeah. So sometimes they are good. Yeah. Let me. I'm gonna click, click live here. So if you're watching this, it's gonna be a bit of a stumble into writer's room. Thanks for being a member. We're gonna start doing more segments here. I'm gonna end the sequence. I'm gonna. I'm sorry. I'm gonna end the stream with Kirk. If you guys didn't see it, we talked about Borderlands Four. Like, what's happening with the game? What do we want to see? Are they gonna go live service? ETC. Click the link in chat to come to writer's room if you guys want to come with us. And there we go. And then I'll.